Good afternoon. My name is Gaston Alonso. I am the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute at, for the Humanities at Brooklyn College. It is a true honor to welcome you to this celebration of the publication of the book Sojourners, Sultans, and Slaves, America and the Indian Ocean in the Age of Abolition and Empire, University of California Press 2023, co-authored by Awan Amka and Brooklyn College's Gunja Gupta. Please let's give them all a virtual uh, round of applause. Now, this event is the second in a series of events that we are hosting uh, to celebrate the publications of recent books by Brooklyn College faculty. The link in the chat has the calendar for those events, and we invite all of you to join us. Now, today's conversation was organized by Professor uh, Sengupta to reflect the themes and the spirit of their book. It will focus on answering the question, what does the story of human bondage look like when we cross it when it crosses its North Atlantic boundaries and steps into the desperate but connected worlds of the Caribbean, Brazil, and the Indo-Pacific? Let me now introduce tonight's speakers and then turn it over to Professor Banarji, who will be moderate the conversation. Gunja Gupta is a professor of history at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of the City of the University of New York. Her current research and teaching interests lie in 19th century US history within global contexts of slavery and colonialism. She's the author of the book For God and Manon, Evangelicals and Entrepreneurs, Masters and Slaves in Territorial Kansas, 1996, From Slavery to Poverty, the Racial Origins of Welfare in New York, 1848 to 1918, published in 2009, and with Awan Amka, Sojourner, Sultan, and Slaves, America and the Indian Ocean in the Age of Abolition and Empire, 2023, as well as numerous publications in scholarly journals like the American Historical Review, the Journal of Negro, now African American History, Civil War History, Kansas History, and Transition Magazine. Edward Rugemer is a historian of slavery and abolition at Yale University. His first book, The Problem of Emancipation, The Caribbean Roots of the American Civil War, 2008, explores how the abolition of slavery in the British Caribbean shaped the coming of the American Civil War and won the Avery Craven Award from the Organization of American Historians, among many others. His second book, Slave Law and the Politics of Resistance in the Early Atlantic World, 2018, it's a comparative history of Jamaica and South Carolina and won the Jerry J. H. Bentley Book Prize of the World History Association. Rugemer's current projects include the editing the Cambridge History of the Caribbean. He has also published articles in William and Mary Quarterly, the Journal of Southern History, Slavery and Abolition, Reviews in American History, and the Journal of the Civil War Era. Swapna Barnarji is professor of history at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Her research lies in the intersection of gender, class, race, and ethnicity in colonial South Asia, and focuses on women, servants, children, fathers, masculinity, domesticity, and family. Her recent monograph, Fathers in the Motherland, in Managing Fatherhood in Colonial India, Oxford University Press 2022, interrogates the strong connection between fatherhood and masculinity. Her book, Men, Women, and Domestics, Articulating Middle-Class Identity in Colonial Bengal, Oxford University Press, 2004, employed the lens of employer-servant relationships to understand the construction of national identity in Colonial Bengal. She's a co-editor of Mapping Women's History, Recovery, Resistance, and Activism in Colonial and Post-Colonial India, 2022, and is currently in a fellowship from the Australian Research Council working on a collaborative research project, Ayas and Amas, Transcolonial Servants in Australia and Britain, 1780 to 1945, which historicizes the traveling Indian caregivers, the nannies, who travel with British and Indian families from India to Britain, Australia, and other parts of the empire from the 18th through the 20th century. Two more quick points. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel for the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities. And, at la and lastly, let me 
thank tonight's co-sponsors for their support of our programming, the Department of English, the Department of History, the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, and the Department of Political Science at Brooklyn College, as well as the um, administrator for the Wolf Institute and my partner in putting on this program in Kiana Benjamin. So you can see the book that we celebrate tonight, like the book we celebrate tonight, our speakers and tonight's conversation travel across borders, across regions, across oceans. We are in for a treat. And with that, I pass the virtual microphone to Professor Banerjee. Thank you. Greetings and thank you everyone, especially Professor Gaston Alonso and the Wolf Institute for the Humanities for giving me the opportunity to share that platform with two profound historians it is truly an event of border crossing in which historians specializing in distinct geopolitical regions traverse and transcend the boundaries of the temporal spatial limits of specific historical fields. I'm a gender and subordinate historian and my personal predilections tend to meld with my professional interests. When Professor Sengupta suggested the title History Without Borders, Besides the riff of feminism without borders, an old memory flashed through my mind. Several decades ago, when I arrived in, the, in this country as a graduate student, my advisor, Professor Peter Grant, a, histori a historian specializing in Middle East, insisted in every conversation we had that I think of history beyond the geopolitics of nation states to develop a broad theoretical paradigm of different hegemonic models that are common across countries and cultures. My training under Professor Grant, a deeply committed historian of political economy and Gramscian notion of hegemony, thus took the path of global comparative history with a regional focus on colonial South Asia. In keeping with the burgeoning trends of cross-fertilization that was informing the historiographies of the 1990s, Professor Grant professed a model of history that has no borders. With my tribute to Professor Grant, I initiate the discussion of Edward Rugemer's slave law and the politics of resistance in the early Atlantic world, a comparative history of Jamaica and South Carolina, and Gunja Sengupta and Awam Apkas, sojourners, sultans, and slaves, America and the Indian Ocean in the Age of Abolition and Empire, two stellar works of history without borders par excellence. With slavery, resistance, abolition, and empire as focal points, the two books are brilliant testimonies to connected histories of the world. The connections that often remain hidden or get subsumed under the concentrated attention to regional specializations. The books open up conversations between distant lands across the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean worlds. India and the US, the US South and the Caribbean, the continent of Africa and the Middle East, despite their distance and distinctiveness, were linked by the march of capital, labor, slaves, concubines, and human rights activists, and different systems of knowledge in the age of empire. Please allow me to make a few specific comments about sojourners, sultans, and slaves. Framing slavery and the abolition that rocked the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean worlds within the context of settler colonialism in the US and dead bondage in India, sojourners, sultans, and slaves displays the historian's crafts at its best. As the authors masterfully weaves a complicated narrative of movements and border crossing out of apparently disconnected, disparate characters and events. Sengupta and Apka make a pioneering intervention in scripting a new multi layered and a nuanced history of the empire, which is comparative, transnational, and global in its scale. The book smoothly goes back and forth between the abolitionist movement in the US, its reverberations in Britain and India, the jewel of the British crown, and then to Canada, the Middle East and Africa by mining multiple archives in India, US, UK, and the African continent. The book unearths 
parallel historical debates and processes surrounding the question of slavery, sometimes in concern and with, and at times divergent from one another in different historical locales. It's fascinating to see how the authors present the conjoined stories of pro-slavery pro orientalists such as H.T. Colebrook with the anti-slavery rhetoric of Ram Mohan Roy, the much acclaimed first modern man of India and his friend and follower, William Adam, situated at Harvard University and establishing the British India Society in England. The pro-slavery stance of Louisa McCord, a plantation owner in South Carolina, and the pro-slavery justification of Tofa Bai, a procuress and a prostitute in the state of Orissa, India, brings a striking contrast yet connected arguments in favor of slavery for very different reasons and concern. Again, the simultaneous interrogations of the lives of the abolitionist Mary Ann Shad Carey, who went to Canada to wager wars and the plea of the Rajput woman called Radha, aka Gul Bihar, to colonial state to leave her harem and the protectors are stunning examples of how a mindful historical rethinking can build bridges ac across continents and in differing contexts. There are a lot more examples that I'm sure Professor Sengupta will address in a lecture. The work lays bare the innovative possibilities of deep historical research by mining distinct and apparently disconnected repositories of sources. It binds the state, the local, the regional, the national, and the global in a strikingly broad canvas of mobilities and border crossing, of defiance and alliances, and of unsettling boundaries in the age of empire and capital. I must say that this is a book which belongs as much to US history as it is to Indian. Sengupta and Amka achieved a tremendous feat in presenting a new world history, a connected history, a comparative and a transnational history all in one. Now, this trailblazing work intersects with my current research focused on a subterranean, but an equally mobile population the traveling ayers are caregivers who went from India to England, Australia, and other parts of the British Empire. As a part of a collaborative research supported by the Australian Research Council, the mobility of the women caregivers I study involved an adventure that engaged them in transoceanic movements. The women I study were women of color. They were engaged in intimate labors and relationships with mostly European people of the ruling community. They crossed the oceans, the Atlantic, the Indian, and the Pacific to go to distant lands for reasons of survival and perhaps for explorations and pleasure. Their journeys, complicated by questions of race, class, and gender, left long trails that we, as a team, endeavor to capture. So I asked the questions Professor Sangupta has raised. What happens when we historians cross boundaries to follow the trail of domestic workers from India to Europe, of Africans landed in India on Arab vessels and Indian concubines in the Persian Arabian Gulf states, meet intercontinental human rights activists and visit American merchants, free cotton entrepreneurs and slaveholders in the 19th century Indian ocean world. Let me share our website to give you a lead to Professor Sengupta's interrogations. So uh, this, no, so this comes from our website, from one of our blogs. And this is a woman. So we have a web exhibit, which I'll go to shortly. And also uh, folk, uh, wanted to focus on this woman who actually, you know, who comes from Bengal, uh, he, she used to take care of the children of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Deere. And when he and his wife both died, she uh, traveled with their daughters to England where this portrait was drawn. Her name was Joanna da Silva. Uh, and uh, her portrait was drawn by a, a very young uh, portrait artist at that time who became very famous later on called Robert Wood in 1792. This portrait now, it, 
basically you know decorates the the halls of European paintings at the Met. I encourage you guys to go and take a look. And so this this is what happens, you know, a, 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 a nanny, a caregiver in the late 18th century, you know, arrives in the halls and decks the halls of the Met in 2020, 2022. So this, this is the kind of travels, you know, that we are talking about. I will also share with you the, the picture of uh, our um, our website and the, the web the link to our website and the exhibit but I don't want to take too much of your time so my, uh, my and this you know for example is a story of a of an ayah and a denied passport that I just you know that just went up that I also also you know so this is you know you, you also see kind of travel documents uh, in its early days and how they were preserved in the colonial archives and this is again you know an act uh, this was a Australian Immigration Restriction Act that was passed in 1901. So these are the kind of things that uh, we can do when we do transnational uh, uh, global comparative research. Uh, I will stop sharing and uh, I will uh, I will uh, encourage, you know, without further ado, I wanted to pose uh, two questions uh, to the speakers that you could handle in the course of your discussion. So uh, could you please illuminate for us about how you conceived your respective projects and then successfully conduct this vast research? That's my first question. And number two is what was the methodology that you followed to bring the disparate actors and spaces together? I will end here. With the, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Sengupta to present her work, followed by Professor Rugemer, and then the Q&A. Okay. Thanks so much, Gaston, Kiana, the Wolf Institute, our co-sponsors, my wonderful fellow panelists, Shapna and Ed, and of of course, our students, my friends, colleagues, and audience members, thank you so much for organizing and coming to this event. A hearty welcome to all of you. So, so good to see you. And a special thanks to Shopna for her kind comments, her uh, insightful questions. Um, and her comments really mean a lot to me uh, because I think so highly of her work. And uh, Ed, whom I met in Abu Dhabi, talking about history without borders, uh, <laughs> My, my students are actually reading Ed, and so uh, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. So let me start by addressing the notion of history without borders. Like historians tend to divide oceans and the lands that border them into these discrete historical geographies, right? And study them separately, such as the Mediterranean world, the Atlantic world. But in reality, down the ages, these worlds have always bled into each other. Particularly as the 19th century dawns, you find that capitalism, empire, technologies of print, uh, transport communication are integrating the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds into a global public square to debate the meanings and merits of slavery and freedom in different parts of the world. And so that something that happened in rural India, let's say an experiment to grow cotton with free labor, reverberates in the slavery politics of a Mississippi. And so in this book, as Shapna says, we mine uh, multinational archives um, to track the circulation of people, the echo of ideas, the resonance of policy among nodes of commercial exchange, imperial power rivalries, reform activism. And what is our narrative campus? Where are these canvas rather? Where are these nodes located all the way from the Anglo-Atlantic? Uh, through the Swahili coast of East Africa to the Middle East and South Asia. Now, people who lived in these places form 
intercontinental networks of various kinds which cross the borders of um, nations and empires. And these networks pitted intercontinental human rights activists and marginalized peoples against multinational slavers and defenders of servitude in different guises, right? From Charleston to London and Calcutta and from Salem through Kutch to Zanzibar. And so these quests, their experiences raise all sorts of questions. Let me start sharing um, a screen with you. Um, so what sorts of questions are we talking about? You know, what did exactly did slavery mean in different parts of the world? What was the relationship between slavery, empire, poverty? How did Atlantic understandings of slavery in the East enter transatlantic contest over freedom? Um, why did American style slaveholding settler colonialism fail in Indian Ocean societies? How did peoples in bondage, this is an important one, define freedom or assert their claims to community, culture, mobility, security from violence? Was there an African diaspora in the Middle East and uh, 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 South Asia? And what was the connection of this diaspora with slavery, right? So let's begin our story with the British Empire. So what happens? Britain emerges from the American War of Independence with a mission that fused its colonial project in Afro-Asia with, with what one historian calls the moral capital of anti-slavery, right? Uh, so Britain is defining itself then as this anti-slavery empire against America's expanding republic of slavery founded on the chattel principle. Now, what is the chattel principle? Um, as we've, in my classes, we've talked about, right? A self-racialized, -re self-reproducing labor force that could be turned into liquid capital, uh, credit, collateral at a moment's notice. Now, in British Asia, however, British colonial authorities, you find, are selectively accommodating South Asian forms of servitude, and they're doing this for reasons of profit, um, revenue, and most importantly, because they don't like the idea of public welfare, right? The same Whig government which enacted West Indian emancipation also reformed Britain's poor laws to undermine poor relief. And so... Uh, uh, the British are using the excuse that slavery in India is not slavery uh, in, say, South Carolina, uh, that it functions as a private form of familial form of social insurance, that it confers upon the poor the right to sell themselves during hard times to better off patrons. And so accordingly, imperial bureaucrats are trying to codify traditional informal relations of dependence into the poor's contractual rights to mortgage their labor for subsistence. In other words, how are these people, uh, these colonial authorities defining freedom as the poor's free will to sign contracts to enter debt bondage? Now, is everyone impressed with this uh, blurring of the boundaries between uh, slavery and freedom? No, you have international human rights activists or, you know, extending South Asia reformers like the feminist uh, social reformer Ram, Raja Ram Mohan Roy to interracial Atlantic abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, uh, George Thompson. And these guys through travel, correspondence, print culture, they forge a a global public square. And there they indict slavery and colonialism as twin evils. They take the colonial state to task for impoverishing the colonized in ways that foster slavery as a mode of subsistence. And they mount these free produce movements to replace slave grown cotton in the Carolinas, let's say Mississippi, et cetera, with free grown cotton in British Asia. And so, Abolitionists then joined hands with manufacturers in Manchester and they pressure the East India Company 
to hire Mississippi overseers and to travel, uh, who, who will then travel to India and experiment with free labor, free cotton. Um, now, who are these guys? Why would these overseers from slave states want to go there? Because they are young men who um, are facing declining social mobility in the South, and they, they want to become settler colonialists, maybe in another part of the world. But American style settler colonialism fails in India, right? Um, because in the 1840s, the British did not have in India the infrastructure of what Sven Beckert calls war capitalism, which secured America's empire of slavery, right? Which is to say, uh, supportive states with the military, judicial, uh, political power to force indigenous groups off the land and coerce, violently coerce labor for private profit. And so these overseers are constantly, uh, you know, uh, short of resources, uh, they don't have access to the best land, peasants don't want to uh, uh, grow cotton, they'd rather do subsistence farming, plus they can't adapt their strategies, cultivation strategies to the soil and climate of India. And so they fail miserably. Uh, of course, uh, the British think that they're ignorant in, in, in America. It was African-American enslaved people who did all the work these guys just looked on. That's what British administrators are saying. So anyway, what is, why is politically, what is the impact? They go back to Mississippi, et cetera, South Carolina, um, bearing tales of colonial horrors and also convinced that uh, the cotton South was invincible. You couldn't grow cotton with free labor, right? And they supply slaveholders in the South with the ammunition to decry the hypocrisy of British abolition. Um, the, uh, so American slaveholders then are saying that their own republic of slaveholders is much more similar to quote unquote oriental arrangements of friendly master slave relations, that it offers a paternalistic antidote to the perils of pauperism and wage slavery and revolution that plagued free societies, that the real slaves were colonized populations starving on the imperial watch of anti-slavery autocrats in British Asia, even as North America's human chattel supposedly flourished under the benign gaze of slaveholding Democrats, right? But now, to argue that North America's links with slavery do not begin and end with the American South. So we tell the story of this New England born union surgeon named Benjamin Wilson, uh, who uh, reinvents himself as a slaveholding sugar baron in the Mozambique Island. You can see where his estate Patsy was located in the Mozambique Channel. Um, so even in the 1870s, even as the United States was experimenting all too briefly with racial democracy during uh, Reconstruction, this guy was this former Union surgeon, right? He was presiding over this magnificent estate, which rose uh, to an elevation of a thousand feet above uh, the sea, sustained by hundreds of enslaved workers, most of them probably Magua speakers from Mozambique. Uh, the estate boasted this multinational uh, staff of engineers and accountants. It had a mansion fitted with electric bells, marble baths, um, a library filled with 5,000 books, an ice machine that dispensed juleps and cocktails, a stable filled with Arabian horses. But there was a problem in this tropical paradise. And what was that problem? The American could never secure title to the land on which his estate stood because, you know, there, were, uh, uh, there was corporate land ownership in this part of the world and unwritten contracts. And the Sultan, who was this, uh, he became, uh, you know, uh, a slaveholder under the patronage of this business-minded Sultan who wanted to promote uh, staple crop 
agribusiness in his domain. And the Sultan tells him it's the sacred law of the Arabs to not grant private property right, uh, rights in land to Europeans. And so before long, you find that Wilson is accusing Abdullah, the Sultan, of trying to take his estate away from him. And the Sultan retaliates um, by, oh, the Sultan accuses Wilson in turn of plotting a, 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 a palace coup in order to secure his estate. Uh, the Sultan then retaliates by ordering his army of enslaved soldiers to tramp through Wilson's uh, sugar uh, uh, estates, uh, firing shots into the air. And so, of course, workers disperse, traders are afraid to do business with Wilson. And to make matters worse, the Comoros becomes a French protectorate in the 1890s, and the French used lip service to free labor uh, and local traditions of unwritten contracts and corporate land tenure as weapons to dispossess Wilson of his estate and give it away to, uh, and it doesn't help that Wilson doesn't know French, so he has real trouble providing paperwork, right, to the French bureaucrats. And when he appeals to the US to send warships to uh, uphold his private property claims, Abdullah later the French write to the State Department saying, seriously, you just fought a civil war over slavery. Are you going to defend this guy who's a slaveholder? So in fact, uh, what you see here is this US Navy paid him a visit in order to investigate slave trading claims against Wilson. The point is that Wilson's story um, is one of precarious mastery, right? Um, uh, uh, Wilson's uh, story basically uh, underscores the fact that without imperial backing, local political uh, uh, support um, or diplomatic cover, um, you couldn't really succeed for very long as a settler colonialist. Um, so you succeeded only as long as you enjoyed the personal patronage of whoever happened to be the ruler at the time. Now, the um, role of enslaved soldiers in the Wilson story opens up another theme, uh, and I'll just address this and, and uh, briefly and then stop. Namely, the diverse statuses and functions of the enslaved in the Indian Ocean. Um, it prompts us to ask a related question, which is, did slavery forge a consciousness of diaspora in Afro-Asia as it did in the Atlantic world? Now, what is a diaspora? We might think of it as an imagined transnational community negotiating multiple belongings and a consciousness of roots separate from the masters or oppressors world, right? Um, in the Atlantic world, we know that collective historical memories of trauma helped forge an African diaspora out of the disparate groups that slave ships transported to the New World. The question is, did Indian Ocean slaveries similarly forge a sense of diaspora? You know, given that there were how, right, hundreds upon thousands of Africans we know in India in, in um, China, in, um, in the Middle East. So was there a diaspora? So for comparative purposes, let's turn to the Atlantic. Um, let's meet the Delaware-born abolitionist, feminist, and pion pioneering uh, Black journalist, Marianne Shad Carey. So Shad Carey, you find, uh, forges this vision of diaspora in solidarity with the Black Caribbean. Her sense of diaspora was based both on a common history of racial slavery, but also solidarity with British anti-slavery. So through her newspaper, Provincial Freeman, she advocated emigration to Canada, which she argued was part of this colorblind anti-slavery empire with a woman at its helm, namely Queen Victoria. And she very strategically seized the liberal discourse of British anti-slavery 
um, of freedom defined as equal opportunity for women as well as men, self-sufficiency, a free market for labor, to challenge pro-slavery allegations that free societies sank into pauperism and revolution. But in the Indian Ocean, you find that liberated slaves were much more ambiguous about British imperial abolition. Now, how do we know this? We know this because the British Navy, of course, is patrolling the waters, right? Trying to stop trafficking in human chattel. And they produced, and partly in order, historians have shown to secure the moral and material foundations of imperialism. But they produced in the process this infrastructure, which was calculated to quite explicitly write the, uh, the enslaved, the rescued captives into the colonial record as beneficiaries of empire, right? Now, this infrastructure, of course, consists of police stations, depositions, law courts, etc. When marginalized women in their various roles as captive, rebel, refugee, crossed the borders of jurisdictional uh, difference over slavery, they generated testimonies that transformed them from objects of benevolence, imperial benevolence, into witnesses and mediators among powerful men you know, sultans, vizirs, imperial bureaucrats. And so we can read the structures and the symbols and the languages of Britain's anti-slavery diplomacy to understand how the enslaved sought a measure of control over their lives, how they asserted claims to community, culture, mobility, security against poverty and violence, and very importantly, to understand whether slavery shaped a diasporic consciousness. So meet Mariana, who appears uh, in this register of liberated captives that's lodged in the British colonial archives. Uh, she also appears in this map. I don't know if you can see my cursor represented by, I think I can't tell, is it a blue line or a purple line right here? Um, so she was this 15-year-old African woman who was captured either from Tanzania or Mozambique. She was taken aboard an Arab ship to Yemen and from there to Western India, probably to be sold as a domestic uh, worker or as a secondary wife. Now, she was found concealed among dozens of African children aged 16 to, uh, sorry, six to 15 in boxes amid uh, consignments of limestone and gun incense aboard an Arab vessel when it docked in Western India. So the British get the local Raja to intercept this vessel and they carry the captives to Bombay. But in Bombay, Mariana was not about to uh, not have her voice heard. She led the, all the African children in a hunger strike to protest the material conditions to which the colonial um, uh, officers were subjecting her. Also, she rejected European uh, custodians uh, and opted instead for African or black Muslim um, uh, guardians. And then take Fatima. Now Fatima is represented by this blue line um, she was, and also in this uh, uh, petition, uh, she was born, you can read this, she was born a Hindu in India, but she was, uh, you know, sold as a slave, uh, as an enslaved concubine in uh, uh, Oman. The British rescued her, tried to send her back to Calcutta, but she didn't want that. She didn't want to go back to Calcutta. Now, there's another, let me just say, uh, this purple line um, is that of Yaqub. He was an Ethiopian who was enslaved in Oman and went to India to learn a trade in Gujarat. And when the British uh, tried to rescue him, he was very indignant. He was like, I came here voluntarily. I want to go back to my master and impress him by letting him know that I learned a trade. Now, what, what's going on here? Why are they choosing their Arab enslavers over their British emancipators? 
because they come from a system in which slavery functioned as a strategy to expand kin groups. Multiracial enslaved dependents, including concubines, had some prospect for social inclusion in the master's community. And someone like Fatima may have preferred this to becoming, let's say, an indentured worker, right, in, uh, in British Guyana. Um, so a more privileged example of this type of uh, enslaved person is Princess Salme. She was the daughter of the Sultan of Zanzibar by his enslaved Circassian uh, secondary wife. Um, but in these contexts, you can see why freedom does not take the form of a liberal individualistic impulse for autonomy under the aegis of an anti-slavery empire. So my point is that these examples underscore the diversity of slave functions and statuses in the Indian Ocean. They explain why some forms of bondage may not have forged a sense of diasporic consciousness in sharp tension with the master's cultural or national identity as in the Atlantic, right? In other words, multiracial enslaved populations in the Indian Ocean did not always translate into sharply defined African or Circassian or Indian diasporas shaped by the trauma of slavery. Thus, refugees in the Indian Ocean sometimes defied imperial narratives that meshed British abolition with notions of freedom, Christianity, and colonial assimilation. Challenging the neat polarities of Oriental slavery and English freedom. But uh, such perspectives also, I think, um, underscore for us the, the fact that while slavery is as old as human history, racialized chattel bondage in the Americas was, was pretty distinctive, uh, underscores the differences from slavery in other parts. Thank you. I think I'm going to, I've spoken too much. Um, I can't wait to turn the stage to Ed. Yeah, thank you very much, Gunja, for a truly insightful, you know, rendition of a very, very complex book and argument. Um, I welcome, you know, Ed, Professor Ed Rubemer to start his presentation. Thank you, um, and thank you, Gunja, for that. That was that, that sounds like a it sounds like a brilliant book. I, I really look forward to uh, to reading it and assigning it to my own class, my own students. Um, I thank you also for the invitation to participate in this panel. I haven't had the opportunity to think about this book for a couple of years, and I, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so my goal with slave law, uh, which may have been a little too ambitious, was to try and get at the essence of, of what enslavement was, uh, to try to understand the political dynamic at the heart of this brutal institution that was the racial slavery, which, as Gunja points out, is a distinctive uh, form of slavery in, in the world history of slavery. It's, 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 I think it's quite unique to the Americas. Um, I chose to do this through a comparative history of Jamaica and South Carolina. Because during work on my dissertation in the first book, I came to realize that these two slave societies had very similar political histories from their similar origins in the expansion of Barbados, um, their significant slave revolts that shaped the history of both places, both slave societies produced very powerful planter classes in their respective communities, the British Caribbean and North America, later the United States. Um, these planter classes are both critical to the form formulation of the pro-slavery argument, uh, which is a response to radical abolition abolitionism that really begins with the writings of the Jamaican Edward Long in the 1770s and reaches its fullest fruition, the writings of John T. Calhoun of South Carolina uh, in the 1830s, and really continuing into uh, some, of the, some of the authors that Gunja was speaking of, George Fitzhugh, uh, William Harper, uh, many of whom are from South Carolina. And when you're, when, you know, when you're designing a comparative study, it's a historical study, it's very important to have a combination of similarities and differences. If you don't have the similarities, 
the different the, the the historical analysis of the differences is not going to be so fruitful. And so that's why I felt that Jamaica and South Carolina would be a good match. Um, I was also interested in contributing to the historiography on slave resistance by integrating slave resistance into the political narratives of each place. I've always seen resistance, uh, the resistance of enslaved people as a, a set of political acts that had significant impact upon the broader society, but which is often omitted from our political narratives of, of, of major events such as the American Revolution or what you might call the imperial crisis of the 1770s. Uh, additionally, with respect to the historiography, in the late 1990s, when I was in graduate school, so I'm dating myself a little bit there, um, there was, and I don't know if, if Gunja agrees with me here, but there's a, there's a palpable shift away from the emphasis on slave resistance, which had really characterized the work of, of the 70s and the 80s. Um, major works uh, like Phil Morgan's Slave Counterpoint, Nye Berlin's Many Thousands Gone, um, both of which were utterly formational in the way I think about slavery. Um, but they emphasize labor and lived reality. They're deep social histories. They, 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 they break the world in geography into geographic regions rather than, than states, which is, which is important. But I felt when I was reading them, you know, as a, as a grad student, that they, they were a bit unmoored from the politics of slavery that I was focused on for the first book. And I, and I wanted to bring that back in to a longer, a longer history of slavery. So notice that I have said nothing about slave law, um, even though that's what the book is about, ostensibly. Um, that's because my decision to focus on the law came after the initial conceptualization of the book. I began the research with legal analysis because when I began the research and writing with two very small children, the comprehensive slave codes were the primary sources that I had access to. I knew from the historiography that the history of slave law began in Barbados, so I spent a lot of time with the 17th century codes of all three colonies, Barbados, Jamaica, South Carolina. And I realized not only that South Carolina had copied Jamaica's slave code word for word in, in 1696, but also that South Carolina revised its slave code repeatedly um, throughout the 18th century from its first code in, in 1696 up until uh, 1740. I think there's five wholesale revisions. Um, in contrast, Jamaica passed a code in 1696 that the assembly did not revise until 1788, almost a century later, and then only as a response to metropolitan abolitionism. So slave law became the framework for the book. Uh, I combined a close reading of the laws with a deep contextualization of their passage. Uh, which I use that, that, that structure and that, that mode of analysis to carry the narrative into the 1830s. And so let me briefly take you through the chapters, uh, through the narrative of the rest of the book. There's two 18th century chapters, the domestication of slavery in South Carolina and the militarization of slavery in Jamaica. In many ways, these chapters are the heart of the book, where I make the clearest distinctions between the slave systems that emerged in each colony. The idea of domestication is not my own. It goes back to an essay uh, by the great Southern historian, Willie Lee Rose, but it speaks to some of the decisions that Carolina enslavers made in the aftermath of the Stono Rebellion, 1739. Uh, namely, a new slave code passed in 1740 that sought to curb the worst abuses of enslavers, um, which had been actually codified in previous iterations of the law, and they, they disappear in 1740. But even more importantly, the imposition of a duty on the transatlantic slave trade passed by the South Carolina Assembly in 1740 effectively halted the importation of enslaved Africans for about 10 years. Um, this allowed for a creolization of the enslaved population in South Carolina. Um, it allowed for an expansion of the internal economy in which enslaved people are personally invested in. Um, 
And there are no more major revolts in South Carolina history until the conspiracy of Denmark Basie in 1822. One of the, the reason why they cut off the slave trade, why the, why, the, why the assembly cuts off the slave trade, is they're very worried about um, Africans as being more prone to revolt. That's the way they understood it. And there's evidence, the evidence of, of that rebellion suggests that a group known as Angolas in South Carolina at the time were really key to that revolt. And this effort to cut off the slave trade is, is, is an attempt to, to stop that process from taking place again, okay? So what happens in South Carolina uh, uh, during this, this same period in Jamaica, um, it's, it's developing in a very different way. Um, the, the root of, of Jamaica's development as a slave society, uh, is really in the First Maroon War uh, that began with the English seizure of the island in 1655. Um, enslaved Africans uh, ran away from the Spanish uh, who occupied the island before the English, and they fought the English. And uh, they secured autonomy uh, from the English colony. And um, as the slave trade really picks up into Jamaica in the 1680s, 1690s, you have several really sizable revolts um, organized along the lines of African ethnicity. And you have significant populations of Maroons that form in both the Blue Mountains in the east of the island known as the Windward Maroons and the Leeward Maroons in, in, in the western, western central part of the island in this region called the Cockpit Country. And the colony uh, tries very hard to suppress these uh, these were these maroons and, and, and fail miserably. Um, by 1739, they, they had fought to a draw and they signed treaties. But what happened during that war uh, is that the assembly and individual Jamaican planters who are now absentees in Great Britain because they've become so wealthy off sugar are lobbying consistently and they have access to Whitehall. And they're recruiting uh, regulars from Great Britain to be stationed in Jamaica. And it's during the First Maroon War that Jamaica begins to, to house a permanent garrison of regular troops. Um, and those troops are at the command of the Jamaica governor, which is a military position in, in addition to being a political position. And those troops are used internally and externally. Okay, And so there's a militarization of this, of this slave society and the way that slave resistance is curbed and challenged and the way that, pro that the profitability of the plantations is kept, um, um, is kept going. Uh, moreover, the Jamaica colony never ends its dependence on the transatlantic slave trade as South Carolina did. Thousands and thousands of enslaved Africans are coming into Jamaica every year for the entire duration of the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, these chapters set up a chapter on the American Revolution. And what I think is my most important contribution here is to observe the very different impact that organized slave resistance had upon these different slave societies. So radical Whig ideology uh, was advanced in each colony uh, that's kind of pointing toward independence. Uh, though with much more enthusiasm in South Carolina, admittedly. Um, and there are pretty well-documented conspiracies among the enslaved in Charleston, South Carolina, and in the plantations uh, surrounding Lucy Bay in Hanover Parish in Jamaica, which is kind of the center of uh, the, north, the northern center of the island. Um, the, the significance of this, okay, is that the threat of slave violence by the enslaved pushed South Carolina elites toward the independence movement already underway in Boston. Uh, the formation of the Provincial Congress in 1775 uh, comes after this conspiracy in Charleston, and they directly cite the threat of slave violence um, as a reason to organize outside of the old colonial assembly and to begin to disregard the, uh, the authority of the British governor, of the royal governor in the colony. Um, and it's really the beginnings of the independence movement in South Carolina. In Jamaica, uh, 
While there is considerable sympathy for the independistas of North America, um, there's the uh, famous uh, Jamaica Petition of 1774, which essentially endorses the, uh, the Patriot cause in North America. But after the conspiracy in Lucy Bay, there's nothing. There's none of that. Okay, uh, The threat of slave violence keeps Jamaica loyal to the empire because by this point, Jamaica had become dependent okay, upon the military force, uh, notwithstanding the capital that's coming in from, 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 from Great Britain to invest in the plantation, the transatlantic slave trade, all of that. But I would emphasize that this threat of slave violence is, is very important to and the, and, the, and the dependence upon the garrison in Jamaica um, to keep that colony loyal. Okay, that difference um, to continue as part of an empire in Jamaica's case or to be part of a newly independent nation was very important. Uh, yet the similarity of these slave societies persists in the aftermath of U.S. independence, especially after the Haitian Revolution. Enslaved people in both South Carolina and Jamaica conspired to rebel in the wake of Haiti, uh, though neither did actually revolt. Um, and the planter classes of both slave societies took advantage of the economic opportunities created by Haiti through investments in cotton in upcountry South Carolina, where rice had been uh, the, um, the, the main crop. Cotton, ex cotton expands dramatically in South Carolina. It's the first place where that happens. And in Jamaica, it's coffee. Okay. Co uh, coffee had not been a major crop before Haiti and after Haiti, with the disappearance of, of Haiti as a coffee producer, really takes off. Um, in the 1820s and 30s, both planter classes emerge as the most vociferous critics of the emerging abolitionist movement. Um, but this is where their very different uh, political positions uh, relative to their larger political entities. So Jamaica as a colony within the British Empire, okay, in a region of the empire that was less important, the Americas, less important than it had been when North America was part of the empire. Okay, It's in a much weaker position, Jamaica is, in comparison with South Carolina as part of the United States. Okay, The Carolinian planters uh, have real authority guaranteed to them by the U.S. Constitution within the United States, okay? And they are able, not by themselves, but a, a, leading, a, a, a leading force in curbing abolitionists um, in the United States, uh, where the movement is, is very slow to emerge um, in comparison to Great Britain, where abolitionism becomes uh, quite influential, abolishing the slave trade, in 1807 and slavery in 1833, um, a full 20, 25 years before slavery is abolished in the United States. And um, so I'm gonna leave it there and, 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 and hopefully have some uh, question and answer. And um, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Ed. You know, it's a brilliant synopsis, again, of a very complicated and larger story. So I welcome questions from students uh, friends, faculty members, colleagues, please raise your hand so I could see. Isaac? Okay, uh, Isaac, yes. yes. Uh, hello, um, huh? thank you both, wonderful talk. Uh, Ed, Professor Rugmer, uh, why don't you think the Jamaican planters reached the same conclusion uh, that the folks in South Carolina did um, that uh, the one of the main causes of these revolts uh, were the constant influx of new slaves from Africa. Oh, I think they did. Um, but they didn't cut it off. Why? No, they were dependent upon it. They were out of the, the, you know, I think in this case, profits, um, profits trumped fear in this particular session. I mean, if you look at, um, you know, you look at Edward Long's book, his account of Tacky's War, uh, which is this, this major slave rebellion uh, that Vince Brown has written about recently. Edward Long knows that it's the Caramontes who organize uh, Tacky's Revolt, which is this major revolt in 1760. There's simultaneous uh, rebellions in five different parts of the island at the same time. It's organized along ethnic lines. 
The planters know it, but they need more slaves. They need more captives from Africa to fuel those plantations. The death rate on Jamaican slave plantations is horrific. Okay? And one way of understanding the transatlantic slave trade is that the planters are basically uh, replacing laborers with recently enslaved captives from, directly from Africa. And if if they don't, this this there's massive capital investment in Jamaica in the 18th century. This is the biggest sugar producer in the, in the British Empire at the time. And um, and they depended upon uh, the regulars. Uh, who are who are garrisoned in the island, and their militia to suppress these rebellions when they emerged, and they did. And um, Jamaica is a very violent place in the 18th century. Other questions, um, my students uh, in the, in the group who read Professor Rugama, I know you have questions. They're normally very very talkative. <laughs> Come on, speak up. I'm not going to bite. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, two of my two of my most successful graduate students are, are students of Brooklyn College. Um, two of my my graduate students who've uh, who've done really great work. Uh, um, one on the Maroons, and, and you know we often think about the Maroons, and I I write this to a certain extent as um as kind of an arm of the state in a way, and that the Maroons are are, are actually so helping the state suppress rebellions. Um, but Alicia, this is Alicia Hall, uh, in her dissertation, uh, shows that there's quite a, quite a lot of connection between enslaved people on the plantations and the Maroons. And she offers a far more nuanced way of understanding the role of Maroons in, in Jamaican history um, than, in the, than the received historiography would have us believe. Mm. Here's a question. Okay, Stephen. Hello. Um, great presentation, by the way. Uh, quick question. So usually when there's scholar scholarship on a lot of topics, there's often, you know, opposing or conflicting views. And I wonder what types of views would those be if you've encountered them and how have they shaped your arguments? Um, Ed, do you want to go first? Sure. Um... Well, one of the one of the interpretations about slave revolts that's um, um, that, that 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 pops up from time to time, going back to Michael Johnson's articles on Denmark Vesey, is that um, slave rebellions are really more about white paranoia, and um, and you if you you can read the evidence that way. Um, but I I think it's far I, I think it's far more interesting to read the evidence, you know, as as um, as evidence of of, of conspiracy um, that there is where there's smoke there's fire, and I think I think um, I think planters, slaveholders, whites, whatever oppressors, enslavers, whatever you want to call them, they they knew what they were doing, they. They uh, they understood the level of brutality, and I think they expected resistance. I mean, you can read, you can go through the work on Thomas Thistlewood. He's he's afraid of of the people he's enslaved on on, on numerous occasions, um, and he responds with tremendous violence. And um, I think so. I, I think when 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 the planters are concerned, they have very good 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 recourse to be concerned. And so that's one example of an historiographic a, a disagreement um, between very good scholars on one hand and myself and others on the other. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So what do we make of historiographical disagreements? Now, one of the advantages, I would say, of um, placing scholarship uh, on the Atlantic world in conversation with um, that in the Indian Ocean is that there is not a whole lot of people who have done that. 
so when the when the book starts to get reviewed, I'm sure there will be some historiographical um, arguments that we can then address. But one of the um, I think one of the things that you can do with comparative work is to show the diversity of perspectives right that existed on a certain uh, on a certain topic but then you can also show the parallels in thinking uh, for example uh, slavery and and poverty you know we've talked in class right about how uh, uh, southern slaveholders made out that their take on paternalism, slavery as a form of social insurance, a paternalistic antidote uh, to the um, uh, uh, revolution and white wage slavery and the, the inhumanity of competitive individualism in free society was highly exceptionalist, right? That some historians have said this was very organic. It, it, hey, you read... Uh, uh, the British colonial records from the early 19th century, and you find that some colonial officials were uh, justifying certain uh, South Asian forms of bondage in very similar terms. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is that. Um, Newman has a question. I was curious about the relationship between Spanish slavery and empire. Also, what happened to the empire after the abolitionist um, movements took hold? So, um, uh, Ed, you know, one of the things that we are talking about in the Civil War class is uh, the question that you posed um, a, a few years ago about why of all the slave societies in the Americas did the United States find a, a fight a bloody war, right? Civil war that ended up uh, ending slavery with the 13th Amendment and so on. I mean, why not Brazil and Cuba? So I'm wondering, um, do you want to maybe briefly address the question of the Spanish Empire and its connection with um, uh, debates over slavery in Cuba? Um, sure. Uh, so with 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 Brazil and Cuba, which are the really the last Atlantic slave societies where where slavery persists well into the eighteen eighties, um, you know. There, 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 there's an abolitionist movement in Spain. There's an abolitionist movement in Brazil, um, but it doesn't. Abolitionism doesn't. Aboli, not, neither abolitionism nor the defense of slaveholding becomes sectional and critical to sectional identity and critical to sectional uh, economies. Okay, and that's the difference. That's really the difference because. In Brazil, I mean, you might say that the, the abolitionist movement is regional to the extent that it's in the cities and it's not in the countryside, okay? Um, and abolitionists are quite aggressive in Brazil in trying to destroy slavery through quite through violent means sometimes. Um, but the slaveholders do not come together and form a confederacy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and part of this, you know, part of this, I think, is is part of this. I think is 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 the democracy in that, um, you know, the causes of the American Civil War are quite are pretty clearly traced to the, to, to a political struggle, and it is the you know, and there are for the entire antebellum period, there are these political parties that absorb the sectional crisis the Whigs and the Democrats, and they're both national parties, okay? But when that system breaks down, okay, and you have the emergence of the Republican Party in, in you know, really the election of 1856, it's really weak, election of 1860, it's stronger, but that's a sectional party. And the Southerners just do not respect the results of the election. 
and and beginning with South Carolina, which is part of what you know drove the uh, the analysis of my you know drove the comparison that I made. You know, they led the Deep South out of the Union, and because they did not recognize the legitimacy of Lincoln, because they thought that Lincoln was an abolitionist. Was Lincoln as much of an abolitionist as Douglas or William Lloyd Garrison? No, he wasn't. Okay. But to a certain extent, that doesn't matter because the Carolinians thought that he was. Mm -hmm. And the Carolinians were able to persuade the other deep South states to come with them. And then after Sumner, the rest of the South. Mm -hmm. Is they did no longer trust the federal government to uphold slavery. That never happens in Cuba. That never happens in Brazil. That's sort of a political dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's not that war wasn't didn't play a role in the abolitions in both places. It did, mm -hmm. but not the same way. I think uh, we can handle Isaac has another question, uh, uh, and uh, you know we will kind of you know you could leave the event. I know we all have multiple commitments, and it's evening time at six forty-five. But now, if we want to carry on discussion, maybe we can carry it on until seven o'clock as it was in the original program, but feel free to leave those of you who have to leave. Uh, uh, Isaac? Yeah, is it, is it, I know you say sectionalism, but is it really I know you say sectionalism, or is it our two party system, really sectionalism, which sort of radicalizes two -party perspectives system, and sends everybody Which sort of corners. radicalizes perspectives and, and sends everybody to their corners. corners. And hardens uh, perspectives. Ed, you go, and, and I, I have a perspective. You can, um, of course, now we are we are migrating from borderless history into <laughs> national <laughs> histories, right? But what happens when you I open know, it up I, to questions? I know, I know, but but um, but yes, let's talk about this. We've uh, yeah, we are almost out of time. Uh, but uh, Ed, do you want to? talk about this for, uh, and this in the wake of you know what happened if we were normally meeting uh well kevin mccarthy who was just oh, out yeah. as speaker talking about political polarization right um so yeah and if you if you want to go in like you know, I, I don't think I don't think sectionalism as a political force is nearly as powerful now as as it was in in the eighteen fifties. Yeah. Um, political partisanship is just as powerful, but that's a different thing. And the Civil War is really brought about by both. There's a lot of old Democrats who become Republicans. You know. There's, yeah. um, you know, there's all, and there's, and there's wigs too. I mean, so, you know, the partisan divisions break down. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get into the coming of the civil war. That's like a, that's not where we're supposed to be. A whole, a whole other, <laughs> and, and we're running out of time uh, anyway, but uh, you know, I said, the thing is that the two party system managed to sort of uh, bury uh, conversations about slavery right until the 1840s it is when slavery enters political discourse that the two-party system becomes incredibly sectionalized and compromise becomes difficult um but um until then you know as long as the democrats and the whigs had bases in both sections as long as they were talking about tariffs and internal improvements um they were able to uh, appeal to voters in both sections it was when slavery enters political discourse that the two party system fractured the national two party system fractures and sectional parties emerge to take their place right but you know and also it's, but to bring us back to the transnational global discourses about mm -hmm. abolition in the, in the british caribbean about slavery in british india played an important role Absolutely. in the discussion about slavery in the united states because slaveholders, you know, pro, pro um, slaveholders would claim Britain are hypocrites. Yeah. Because South Asia, India, as the way they said it, mm -hmm. is is run by slaves. The whole labor force is enslaved. Yeah. But that's what the Southerners would say. 
Yeah. And so then in, in comparison, we we have a much a much gentler slavery than the British do in India. Right. Yeah. right. So Ellen has a question, very, very interesting question, if you could handle that. <clears throat> what uh, are the differences in climate in the vastness of North America versus the relative homogeneity of climate in the Caribbean islands of India? Lay in the <laughs> site. Uh, Ellen, I think that is worthy of a dissertation and mm -hmm. a book. <laughs> so, um, so okay, I'll I'll talk about this very. I know we are out of time. So historians have talked about how the monsoons, uh, the northwest and the uh, northeast and the southwest monsoons, played a really important role in uh, determining the direction of trade, um, determining what items got exchanged in that trade, um, in determining, um, you know, uh, let's say, uh, crop failures and that sort of thing, which in turn often spawned poverty and um, enslavement and so on. So the environment played an incredibly important, the diversity of environment in the Indian Ocean world played a really important role in some of the um, differences that we are talking about. Uh, Ed, do you want to, before we, um, everyone is is hungry, they want to go eat, so <laughs> right after, um, if you want to address uh, this question. Nothing, of... nothing major to add. I mean, I yeah. mean, climate, climate has, is, is a huge factor in, um, in shaping national and regional histories. And, um, you know, I think environmental history is, is a very exciting field, an exciting and growing field, if that's where you're headed. Ellen, I think that's I think that's fabulous, and I think you should pursue that. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, and I don't anticipate any more questions. And thank you, the speakers, for really a very very enlightening session. Uh, we thank hope you. to carry on the conversation, and I encourage every one of you. If you have further questions, you could surely reach out both Professor Gemmer and Professor Sengupta. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank Gans you. Uh, everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks, thanks for the invitation.